I will. Let's connect this part right here as well. All right, this is probably the part two of the Asir, Osiris, or the Hebrew Osiris in this Torah portion, the Hebrew Osiris. And we're not going to go over the metaphysical of Asir. That's in the previous portion. What we are going to do, and what we do seek to do in this um, second part of the Hebrew Osiris, is to further touch on some other examples to prove our point about the connection of this. Already, the New Testament, Acts of the Apostle, chapter 7, verse 22, it says that Moses was learned in the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in word and deed. So him, no doubt, as well as the other Israelites, from what we can establish so far, by this interconnectedness, you know, with the Hebraic and the biblical matrix here, you understand, we can see that even Korah, you understand, and Datan and Abiram, which we have yet to go into their respective names as well, you understand, perhaps in ancient Egypt they were priests. Perhaps they were some priests of a particular order, particular Osirian order. It, it's most likely logical, but of the false Osirian order, remember Moses, he was learned in the wisdom of the Egyptians, but properly translated from Numbers chapter 7, verse 22. It's not just the Egyptians, it is the Egypts. So that means we have Upper Egypt, which is Ethiopia, Tovia, and the outlying provinces like Median. Remember, Jethro was a Median knight. Uh, uh, his wife was... Uh, Ethiopian, so that means Median and Ethiopian have some relationship. It's like if you are an American, but you're living in Texas, you're a Texan. So we can say, oh, the Texan in one place, and then in another place we can say the American. But we're referring to the same person. But y'all would understand that, just like I and I understand that Jethro, the Median knight, was an Ethiopian and that Medina, uh, um, Medina or Median was a particular province, you understand, of ancient Tobia. But when we speak of ancient Tobia or Ethiopia, we're speaking of upper, what's known as upper Egypt, or the headwaters of the Nile, or where legend and mythology and ancient teaching, the e Egyptian idea says that Osiris and the so-called gods, or the Netaru, the Egyptian Elohim came from Tobia or Ethiopia. So Moses, being learned in the wisdom, remember the word wisdom, some interpret that to mean the mystery school, the mystery schools, or some can say that was like being a college graduate, you know, in, in, in some sense of skill. There was different, of course, departments, different studies, but if you was one of skill and craft and trade, if you could read or write, so forth and so on, if you administered in the government, whatnot, you needed to have these skills. And it was in the mystery schools and other such related schools that ones who, in other words, if you want to excel in Egyptian society, you had to go to college or university. And that was basically the mystery schools. Just, let's just simplify that right there, because a lot of people want to spook you out, you know what I'm saying, keep you in spook zone. We're not dealing with no spook zone. You know what I'm saying? Now, with Osiris, here's, here's the next matter we want to show. This particular book right here, mm -hmm. this is a book of the beginning by Gerald Macy. A book of the beginning by Gerald Macy, right? This is volume two, right? A book of the beginning by Gerald Macy, right, and it's published by the Society of His Imperial Majesty, right, and this is volume two. So we recall in, in our studies that we came across some very interesting um, readings in this, but now in context of our Rastafari sabbatical studies, we can reference it with particular um, areas that we're studying and get a little more fullness, you know, get a little more as Rastafari, as I and I say, more overstanding. So here we're in volume two of a book of the beginnings, and we're going to go to uh, page um, 80, 
Let's go to page 87. Let's go to page 87. Although there's as much information as anybody knows Macy's, Gerald Macy's works, as much information that's compacted in here. Now, when we first were looking for Cora, we only found one or two under the K-O-R-A-H. Not C-H, but K-O-R-A-H. But now, in this particular book, we notice that he was spelling it in a more um, etymologically correct way with the Q. So Macy, in his book, if you are researching Macy's works, it is Q-O-R-A-H, and he also has Q-O-R-A-C-H. But then this will be consistent with Macy since Macy has given more credence to the Ethiopic, the Ethiopic beginnings. He's given more credence to the Ethiopic beginnings, unlike many of the other um, so-called Europeans or, or uh, e Egyptologists. Many of the Egyptologists ignore that the root of ancient Egypt was Ethiopia as the Nile waters flow, you understand, from south to north. So they, they, they ignore that purposely because that would put them in the black. You see, they, they, they don't want to put them in the black, so instead they try to keep it in the red. They try to keep it in lower Egypt and don't want to go to the black. Because if they go to the black, then it's, it's black. You know, and then they, all their lies, you know, and begin to crumble of their own um, weight, in other words. Weight is a heavy load, as I and I say. Now here, on page 87, I want to share, just read a little bit of this to you and annotate as we go along. Now, why we're focusing on this, we're focusing on this part mainly of where did Korah go? Where did he go? Korah went to hell. In other words, what Moses did, in a sense, was like saying that um, if these men don't go to hell, then Jah has not chosen me. It's basically what Moses said. That these men are going to have to go to hell. You know and you're going to see them go to hell, and they saw them go to hell. So let's Let's now look in um, um, the Midbar, right? And let's just read um, the summary, the Jewish summary right here. Korah's rebellion. A Levite, the Levite Korah, son of Izhar, he joined with the Reubenites, Datan and Abiram. Remember, Reuben was the firstborn. So he joined with the Reubenites. Now, remember the name Ru, Reu. Reu is, comes from, is similar to Rei. In ancient Egypt, Ray means to see. Bamarinya Rai, and in good is Rai means the vision. And we've taught on that um, and made that connection there. So Rai means vision. Um, Reu in Hebrew means to see. So Reu Bain means see a son. Bain means son. Reu Bain. In other words, you all look a son. So he was the firstborn. Now, I'm making that connection with Ra and Ray and so forth and so forth, the name Reuben, right, the son, the firstborn, because that firstborn son coming out of Egypt will be that Cheru, will be the Horus. So no doubt Reuben and the Reubenites being that firstborn coming out of the context of Egypt felt special about themselves, no doubt, because after all, in the society in which they were in, the popular mythology or the understanding or the religion or the spirituality dictated a son being born, and that firstborn son idea is very prominent, as we see throughout the Bible and even the ancient, as well as the modern world. Mm -hmm. Now, because a lot of families still have problems with who's born first, you know, the firstborn, you know, and, and who's the firstborn or who has that, 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 that supremacy or authority. But anyway, um, Korah, he joined with the Reubenites, Datan and Abiram, sons of Eliab and On. Now, the name On is also interesting because On was the city of, uh, I think, Heliopolis, the city of the sun in ancient Egypt. You understand? And on is another way of saying on or oin, the eye. The, the eye is coming out again. You, you have the eye or by another permutation, the fountain. So on was the son of Peleth. And 250 chieftains of the Israelite community rose up against Moses. 
250. I want you to just think of what was going on here. Remember, remember what point they are at in the story. Remember where they're at in the story. Mm -hmm. Skin brothers and sisters, there's a heat wave going on. The heat is on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these three led 250 chieftains. Remember, we're not saying 250 people. Right? We're talking about 250 Rosses. There were 250 Rosses now that were aligned against Moses and Haron. You know, they say as times change, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Okay? Uh, Numbers 16, verses 1 to 2. So Moses, he told Korah and his band, he told Korah and his band to take their fire pans and put fire and incense or ishents on them before Ha Elohim. In other words, take your fire pans and put ishents or incense, it on, put it on, on it. Now, whether this is the kana balsam type, we will go into a little bit later, all right? Because remember, there's two types of basic incense. There's one, the frankincense kind, and there's the kana balsam kind, biblically, scripturally speaking. So they put incense on them before God, Ha Elohim, Numbers 16, verses 6 to 7. Now, Musa, Moshe, he sent for Datan and Abiram. He sent for them. He, you know, he sent the messenger, call them, tell them come check me. But they refused to come. They, they refused to come. They, they, they did not come forward. Numbers chapter 16, verse 12. Now, the next day, Korah Korah, and his band, his band took their fire pans, and they gathered the whole community, Kol Yishroyel, Israel Hulu, against Musa and Aaron. At the entrance, the, the Dejaf of the Dinquan, or at the gateway of the Mishkan, the tabernacle. Keep that in mind, Mishkan. Mishkan, if you've been following the studies and following up, Mishkan is the Hebrew word for tabernacle. Mishkan, either M-I-S-H-K-A-N, or some spell it M-E-S-K-A-N. And we're going to link on that when we get into a book of the beginnings, Volume 2 by Gerald Macy. So they gather the whole community against Moses and Aaron at the entrance of the tabernacle, Numbers, chapter 16, verses 18 to 19. Now the presence of the Lord, the presence of Adonai, the Shekinah, the Sekinah, the shock and awe, the presence of the Lord appeared to the whole community. Ha Elohim, Baruch Blessed be he, told Musa and Aaron to stand back. Jah told them just to stand back. Now, you have to count the number of times that Jah says, whenever the Israelites are getting on like they're getting on, Jah is like, you know, let's just done it. Let's just done it. This is why it became a ministry of death. You know, when we read in the New Testament, you know, how it was a ministry of death. Not because the law was intended or Jah's word was intended, but because the people were unwilling to make their wills obedient to good influences. So, of course, it began to look to any casual observer like, you know, there's enough death going on over there. That must not be a good thing, a good religion or whatnot, because people are dying too much. You understand? But now the presence of, of Jah appeared. And Jah told Moses and Aaron to stand back so that Jah could annihilate the others. Jah appeared and said, Jah said to Moses and Aaron, stand back, stand down, stand back, back up. Let, let, let Jah annihilate these ones. Kill them, destroy them. Numbers 16, verses 20 to 21. Now, check, the, and you always find this happening. Whenever Jah says this, Jah said this in the, in the last Torah portion too. In the, in the previous Torah portion, I think if I'm correct, in the Torah portion before that. You understand? Because it just shows you something about niggas, black people. You understand? I'm talking about this black people, this lost sheep of the Beta Israel. You can see that nature over and over, and you don't find that in any other so-called race or group of people other than the lost sheep. That's what proves who the lost sheep really are. Numbers chapter 16, verses 20 to 21. So Moses and Aaron, they fell on their faces. They prostrated them, them, themselves all the way on their faces, and they implored Jah. They implored Ha Elohim not 
to punish the whole community. This this is interesting, Numbers chapter 16 and 22. It doesn't say so, but it's kind of interesting because it's like don't punish the whole community. What do you mean? Punish a couple of them? I mean, don't you see all of these, these chieftains? Because the chieftains are against you. That means that the majority of the people are against you too, you know. But John told Moses to instruct the community to move away. So John said, tell the community to move away, to separate themselves from the tents of Korah, Korah, Datan, Abiram, and they did so. While Datan and Abiram and their families, they stood at the entrance of their own tents. So Datan uh, and, and Abiram and their families stood at the entrance of their tents in Numbers chapter 16, verse 23 to 27. Moses, Musa, he told the Israelites, Beta Israel, that if these men, that if these men were to die of natural causes, you know, like old age and so forth and so on, if they were to die of natural causes, then Jah did not send Moshe. Right? Then Jah did not send Moshe. But if Jah caused the earth to swallow them up, so this this was shows that Moses, Moshe was the true prophet. He didn't just say after something happened, yeah, yeah, I knew that was going to happen. No, he said if this specific thing does not happen, right, then, then God did not send Moses. But if the earth caused, but if God caused the earth to swallow them up, then these men had spurned God. These men had rebelled against God. They basically said that Jah is a liar. Numbers chapter 16, verses 28 to verse 30. Just as Moses finished speaking, just, just as he finished saying what he had to say, the earth opened. The earth opened up, right? Well, as we will say in the Hebrew idiom, the earth opened her mouth. You understand? It opened her mouth and it swallowed them. Their households and all of Korah's people, all of Korah's people, right? And the Beta Israel. The Israelites fled in terror. You want to talk about terror? You've seen the 9-11 video, right? Like when people running. But, but, but remember how many, what was it, 2 million or so people? You understand? I mean, just think about the chaos. The chaos after Moses says this thing. They see God's presence. Moses says, says what he says to them. The earth opens up. It swallows them, it swallows their families, it swallows their household, it swallows all of Korah's people, and the Beit Israel, they just run away. Numbers chapter 16, verses 31 to 34. Now, there's an interesting note right here, because um, a fire, it consumed the 250 men offering incense. So... The, there were 250 chieftains. Remember, I keep emphasizing they was not just regular people. You understand? In other words, they were not just regular members. They were officers, to say. They wasn't just regular people. They were like rosses. And a fire consumed 250 men offering the Aishans, offering the incense, Numbers 1635. Now, Jah told Moses to order Eleazar, which is another interesting combination of the same basic root name coming out of Egypt, Eli, Eli Azar, you understand, or Hail, you understand, Hail Asar, you understand, the priests to remove the fire pans as they had become sacred. So now after this incident where the fire burns up 250 chieftains who are burning Aishan for incense, they get burned up, but then Moses orders Eliezer, the priest, to remove the fire pans from the wreckage. They're burnt. They're crisp. They're done. This is really an example of being done. These, these niggas, they were done. But notice, Eliezer now removes the fire pans because they had become sacred. They had become kedus. They had become a holy. And have them made into plating for the altar to remind the Beta Israel that no one other than Aaron's offspring, nobody other than Aaron's offspring, 
should presume to offer aishans, should presume to offer incense to Ha Elohim in Numbers chapter uh, 17, verses 1 to 5. Now, let's just pause for the cause right there. Now, that's very, very interesting. I mean, on, 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 on numerous counts right there. But what's, I would say, what's kind of most interesting is that no one but Aaron's offspring are to offer Aishans. That gives a whole new kind of context, you know, understand, to like the code legalize it on next level, if you, if you think about it. You understand? It, they thought that, well, they could just like the, you know, Aishans. They could do the same thing. Oh, we see what you're doing. We could do the. And they probably thought in their own heads and hearts that this is better because there's much more of us. There's 250 of us. You, there's not just the couple of folks with you and, and, and Aaron, but look at all of us. We can do the same thing. Look what we can do. Look what we can do. Look what we can do. Um, but look what was done to them. Mm-hmm. Now, what's the connection with Korah? Before we go forward into the plague, because a plague came against them, because once again, in the next portion, if we go forward just a little bit right here, the next day, say the next day, the next day, the, the next day, not like a week later, a month later, let's just ease off for a while, but no, the next day, the whole Beta Israel community, they railed against Moses and Aaron for bringing death upon God's people. Ain't this something? Ain't this something? They railed against Moses and Aaron. They didn't come and say, oh, man, have mercy on us because, you know, they were, they were trespassing. They were rebelling what, what, what Jah has set in motion, Jah's will. No, they instead came against Moses and Aaron for bringing death upon Jah's people. They blamed them for this. Not that the people were blameworthy for their own iniquity, but no, they blamed Moses and Aaron for bringing death upon God's people. Get that part right there. They still think of these people as being God's people. Now, if they all had the same conception of God, how could this be possible? But you remember that Moses was learned in the wisdom of Egypt, and he was mighty. Remember that word in Acts of the Apostles 7 and 22? He was mighty in word and in deed. And that's an example in Numbers chapter 16, how he was mighty in both word and the deed that was done. But still, the people didn't get it because they were, they had a different interpretation of this. You have to understand the connection of the so-called Egyptian mythology to the, to the Hebrew story, to the Hebrew story, how it provides the backdrop. And many of the preachers and pastors never really understand this. This is why there's so much contradictory, confusing information that you find out there about a very simple, clear understanding to a basic story, our story. A cloud covered the tabernacle and Jah's presence appeared. Again, the cloud came. Again, Jah's Shekinah or Shekinah, his shock and awe also came. His presence, his face, his panim appeared, right? The triune God's face appeared, Numbers 17 and 6. Now, Jah told Moses to remove himself and Aaron from the community so that God might annihilate them, and they fell on their faces. Every time Jah says, you know what, I'm tired of these people. I'm just tired of these people. Notice what the people, the people came against Moses and Aaron for bringing death upon God's people. They still were believing that these rebels, you see how the people can be? The people were believing the rebels. You understand? Instead of Jah's true ministers, though Jah's true ministers was true in word as well as in deed, that did not affect them. That didn't affect them. So what Jah said is, Jah told Moses and Aaron to, to, to move away. Remove yourself. Move away from the community. Leave these people so that Ha Elohim Baruch Hu might annihilate them. And instead, Moses and Aaron, they fell on their faces, Numbers 17, 8 to 10. Moses told Aaron to take the fire pan, 
to put fire from the altar and ancients on it and to take it to the community, to take it to the community and to make expiation for them and to stop the plague that had begun. So somehow Moses recognized what was going on, and he tried to stop this, right, this plague that had begun, and Aaron did so. He did as ordered. He did as he was commanded, Numbers chapter 17, verses 11 to 12. Now, Aaron, he stood between the dead and the living, between the living and the dead. Now, notice the idiom, the type of speech of the language, right, and um, also understand the context of it. He stood between the dead and the living, and he halted the plague. The plague had to, had, to, had to stop, had to slow down. But this was not before 14,700 had died. Numbers chapter 17, verses 13 to 14. So 1,000, I mean 14,700 had died of some plague. Now, we don't know exactly what this plague was, what kind of dis-ease it was. But they have brought curse upon curse upon curse, judgment upon judgment of them, and they turned the ministry of Moses or the ministry of the law into a ministry of death. It was not that Jah had a ministry of death. He is the God of the living, not of the dead. You understand? But it's the people's rebelliousness or their still being in bondage, right, in bondage. Remember, he took them out of Egypt, the house of bondage, but yet the ideas of the house of bondage were still in them. I mean, imagine, you take black people out of America, you put them in Africa, they still going to have a lot of their black people ways still in them. This is why the wilderness was this purification zone, you right? It was a necessary part of it, but the people began to wander in it, you understand, because they were disobedient. So here this sets us up now for the miscal, right, the, mis, the, the miscal, right? It's a term found in the titles of the Psalms in the Bible. The Hebrew gives no primary account of the word, and it is usually derived from a word called sakal. S-A-K-A-L, to give instruction. Remember it says that, and Moses and Yah, Jah instructed Moses, instructed him, Sakal, to give instruction. Now, in the Egyptian, this is known as the Sekha, the Sekha, right? Sekha or Sekher, to give counsel and instruct. But such is not the meaning of Maskil. Such is not the meaning. We find it in a, quote, psalm of David, my skill, right? To the chief musician, my skill. For the sons of Korah, my skill. To the chief musician upon Mahalat, my skill. On Neganot, my skill. A maskil of Asaph, my skill of Haman. In this instance, my skill is synonymous with a psalm or a prayer. So my skill has a connection of a psalm, or a prayer, which is a cry, which is a cry from the depths, like many of the Psalms, a cry from the depths. Just recall that there was a, a CD that I put out, a Roots CD some years ago, and that was called Cry from the Depths, and that was based on some of these um, enigmatic Psalms. You know, there are some Psalms that the content is so either mythical it is so uh, mystic, um, and, and some of it, if you don't really understand, it can seem, uh, not scary, but it's like, wow, this is really deep. You understand? But there's a context to it. That's why we have to study and show ourselves the proof so we don't get confused. Now, some examples of these cries are, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the depths. I am shut up, and I cannot come forth. Will thou show wonders to the dead? Question mark. Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave? Question mark. The speaker 
is in the mess car of the Egyptian Hades, the speaker of these psalms. So within the psalms, we have portions of the ancient Egyptian mysteries, right, as they were overstood or reinterpreted or properly interpreted according to the Hebraic context. That's part of the mystery of the scriptures. That's kind of what connects this with that. That's why in order to, to really understand even Torah and the scriptures or even Christianity, you must understand the context and the ancient Egyptian, ancient Ethiopian context of these subject matters if you want to understand them, if you want to comprehend them the way that it was. It is what it is, and not it, it ain't what it ain't. You know what I'm saying? So the Meskar, the Miskar, the Mesken, all Egyptian, are names of the birthplace and the eschatological place of rebirth from Mes, generation and birth. Now, remember that word generation had, had actually come up in Asir, generation, where it spoke about, it spoke about bondage, he spoke about generation, sorrow, and death, all connected, right? So mess is generation and birth, whence the regeneration and the rebirth of the mess ayah, the mess ya, the mess ja, the mess ayah, messiah. The type exists in the Hebrew Mishkan for the tabernacle, the habitation, the dwelling place, and the mishkar. Mishkar is for the womb of the dawn, the womb of the dawn. Now, this is interesting, too, because Bamarinya, the word Tuat, 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 or Tuat, it means the womb of the dawn. It means the, the morning, the early morning. Well, the, the womb of the dawn is a, a very good um, idiom. That is used. You can see that the language itself is like a verbal hieroglyph. You understand? Know it, it, it's verbal, but it's painting a picture. You understand? Know so the tuat, the duat, you see the connection? The connection is becoming very much more clear. And the mishkab, the mishkab is the couch, which is at once the bed of the living and the dead. The bed of the living and the bed of the dead. The womb and the tomb as shown by the various texts. Now, in the ancient Egyptian ritual, the place of rebirth for the deceased is also called the Mesca, the, mes, the, the Mesken, or Meshen, and the Meskar. Now it will be shown that the certain utterances for deliverance, there are, cert that there are certain utterances for deliverance that we find in the, in the Hebrew in the Hebrew Psalms are the same as those in the book, the so-called Book of the Dead or the Purt in Kheru. Therefore, we connect Maskil with the Egyptian Meskar in this way. The Meskar or Purgatory was the place in the Hades where the souls, the souls in bondage, get that word again, bondage, once again a connection with Asir, Osar or Osiris, the souls in bondage awaited, they were waiting, and they prayed for rebirth. They were in pain. They were in prison. They were undergoing the pangs of punishment, much like the lost sheep of the Beta Israel, I and I, landless, landless ones here in a land that is not our own, wandering in this wilderness of North America, you understand? In the Hebrew, right, in the Hebrew, it is um, mesgar, misgar, misgar, mesgar, misgar, right? And they say the enclosing, imprisoning, where a prison, whence a prison or a place of confinement, the miskar. Now, maskar in Egyptian is a cry of supplication for the rebirth in the Meskar, Meskar, Meskhen, a psalm or prayer for the new birth, a psalm or prayer. And so what is that first word that Yeshua, the Messiah, 
the Messiah says. He says, what, repent, repent, and be born again. That, that rebirth, that, that rebirth. So, so this was clearly overstood within the mysteries. And it's clearly overstood that Moses overstood this or understood this. It may be noted that from the same, from the name of this Meskhen or purgatory in the lower region comes the Hebrew Meskhen, which means to bow down, to be low, to be poor, the state of being low or wretched. The Maltese, uh, uh, Aramaic, and Arabic Mesquin, the Italian Meschino, the French Mesquin, the Portuguese Mesquinho, the English Mesquins, and um, Mesquin. Mesquin is also Bamarinya, is in the Amharic and the Ethiopic as well. So we find that even in these far off languages, there are certain key ancient words that still remain embedded as almost the, the, the cornerstones within various cultures that connects them to this universal, we could say, matrix, in other words. The maskil was the prayer or utterance. The maskil was a prayer or an utterance from the depths, from being in a very low state. The cars, what's known as the cars of the Hades the cars of the Haiti, not cars, C-A-R-S, but K-A-R-S, almost like the different levels. The continual prayers for the sons of Korah uphold the sense here assigned to masculine. That in the Bible we have a series of continual prayers for the sons of Korah. And that's what you have, the thing that used to not confuse me, but I used to wonder about it, like in reading some of the Psalms, I'm saying son, for the sons of Korah. I'm like, why the song is for the sons of, wasn't it the ones who rebelled and they went in the earth and the earth swallowed them up and they went in the depths and I thought, okay, they're dead. But then when you read the language, it's like they went down living and then you have ones praying for them, you know, saying within the Hebrew Psalms and it's right there. What, the, what does this mean for the sons of Korah? You mean the same ones who were swallowed up in the earth? Exactly. You understand? They said the truth is what stranger than fiction, right? The continual prayers for the sons of Korah uphold the sense he assigned to masculine. Korah was fabled to have been swallowed alive by the earth. Prayers for the sons of Korah are similar, check this out, are similar to those for souls in purgatory offered up by the Roman church by the Roman church. Now, I think a sister, if I'm correct, I got a message about a, a, a sister had called forward and asked a question, something on purgatory. And I don't know if we got back in touch with that particular sister. Hopefully she gets to check this, check this out, that, 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 that um, where the sons of Korah went, being swallowed by the earth within the Hebrew sense, they continue to think on these ones because there were specific, specified psalms that we even have in the Psalms of David that were for the sons of Korah, you know what I'm saying, which we now find are very similar, you know what I'm saying, in sense and essence to the, to the prayers that are offered for the souls that are in purgatory by the Roman Catholic Church, so that Roman Catholic Egyptian connection, you know, can be even understood in that context. Now, the blind and fumbling helplessness of the unskilled, the idiotes in representing the myth as miracle, is at times very pitiful, as in this case of the sons of Korah. The name of Korah in Hebrew signifies, now, this is interesting from this perspective, he said that the name of Korah in Hebrew signifies an accident, a sudden hap, like a sudden happening, such as was the fate assigned to the sons when the earth opened and swallowed them. Korah, without the H, it denotes crying and calling, similar to Kore right here, and Kore, crying and the Kura, the Kura or the raven. In Amharic, the raven, the Korah. Remember um, Noah, he sends out the raven, 
and then he sends out the dove. So calling or crying and calling. Now, he has here, Kharu, Kharu, Egyptian, means the evil ones. Kharu, K-H-E-R-U, Kharu, means the evil one, ones, the fallen enemies. But the full form of the word is Korach. In other words, Korach. This is the full, this is like the old form of the word with this ch sound at the end. Unused in Hebrew, which means to freeze, to freeze, or stiffen, to stiffen with cold. Now he has ak, A-K-H, Egyptian. It denotes the dead, ak. Wow, that, 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 that brings a whole new meaning to it. Like you say, what's up, ak? Aki, ak, A-K-H, from the Egyptian, it denotes the dead. Korach identifies the dead below. Korach, this identifies the dead who are below or who are in the netherworld, the netherworld, or the underworld. Now, they are in the car, the car, K-A-R, of the underworld, those who were cut off, they were cut off. Korah, in the form with K-O-R-A-H, not C-H, but H, right? Here they have is for baldness. Has a derivative sense from cutting off the hair for the dead. That they made baldness. So once again, a further link with what was going on. It was almost a clash of priesthoods. It was a priesthood that continued out of Egypt that had clashed here in this Torah portion with Musa. And they lost out. That although they were in the Egyptian idea of things from, from, from Egypt, Moses, now in that which was the new or the renewed, had the real power to affect what they believed in their mythology which is kind of very, very interesting right here. Yovah's the sons of Korach. So this group of psalms utters the cries of those whom the earth has swallowed, just as it swallows the souls in the book of Hades, in what's known as the book of Hades. Now, in one of these, namely the 49th one, the speaker says this, my mouth shall speak of wisdom. My mouth shall speak of wisdom. This means according to gnosis or gnosis, according to knowledge, it's according to scientia or scientia, according to, to um, ilket, you understand? According to aimro. I will incline my ear to a parable, to a parable, to a myth, a parabolical statement. I will open my mouth upon the harp. I will open my mouth now up musically. I will open my dark saying, rather, my dark saying upon the harp. This was one of the chida or the chetu. The chetu in Egyptian were secret things, things shut and sealed to those who rewrote the mythos as history. In this, in this psalm, the sons of Korah are the wicked. They are the wicked who are laid like sheep, like lost sheep, like sheep in the grave for death to feed on. So death was conceived as a living something to feed on right there in the Bible, just like in ancient Egypt, you understand, with um, um, what I meant it, you understand, um, um, who also is that kind of weird monster that feeds on the dead of the, the wicked, the unredeemed. Notice they're not redeemed. They're not redeemed in the, in the Moshiach. You know, they have no redemption. The unredeemed for those for whom there is no resurrection. So if there's no redemption, there's no resurrection. So these are the unredeemed, and for them there is no resurrection. Hence, they are the sons of of the house of hell. They are the sons of the house of Sheol, of Sheol. Quote, I remember thee 
from the hill Mitzar. In um, Psalm, what which Psalm is this? X L I I six. This is Psalm forty um, seven. Psalm forty seven and six. It says right here, I will I remember thee from the hill Mitzar. Mitzar is the star of Mest in the great beer, the type of the birthplace, and the speaker is in the place of rebirth. They're in the place of rebirth. Now, for us, in Rastafari revelation, based on our divine heritage, the place of rebirth would be the church or, or the churchical state. That's the place of rebirth or the mother. You understand? Know this in Gamarium, in the mother or in the church. You understand? Know where two or three are gathered, even if one is alone. He says, if you keep his word, you understand? Know then him and the Father will sup. You know what I'm and the Holy Spirit, the, the, the triune God, and that one. So there's, there is that square, the four, the cross, you know what I'm the square or the cipher, the circle. So even that individual, any of us in true prayer and true word, you know what I'm saying, we are not alone. So we're in that place of rebirth because we are in that churchical consciousness. You know what I'm Now if everyone is able to be in that churchical consciousness in the visibly, you know what I'm saying? Then when we come together collectively, there's no room for mixed up moods and attitudes. You know what I'm saying? So, so there is our unity in the knowledge of the Son of God. Now, it says, furthermore, thou hast sore broken us in the place of dragons and covered us with a 